Welcome to the Texas Truck Channel Podcast. This is episode 37. Yes, it's time for all those lists at the end of the year, just like everyone does. And we're not immune to it either, and we're going to do the same. So, but first, a word from our sponsors. This podcast is brought to you by ICE. No, not that one, or that one, but the old faithful standby. Internal combustion engines. Having served you with reliability and great sound, they would now like to highlight their quick recharge times and great range. Have a road trip to go on and no time to recharge? No worries. Just stop at any of your local recharge stations, also known as a gas station, and get a full recharge in five minutes, sometimes less. Worried about range? Fear not. Internal combustion engines will get you on average 300 miles, depending on the model, and in many, 400 or even more. Internal combustion engines, serving your car needs for well over 100 years. Now, back to the podcast. What we have for you with this particular list at first is a crossover list. I know we just talked about the best crossover overlanding rig and setup on the previous pod. We thought we'd just continue that theme with crossovers because there's a bunch of good ones out there. And we're going to, don't worry, we're going to give you a top five list for real full frame, low range transfer case SUVs in another pod. And then later the top five trucks of the year. But we wanted to start with crossovers because there's, again, there's a bunch of good ones. Um, so we'll just jump right into it. Kind of our criteria for the crossover segment was it couldn't be a real SUV. We're defining a real SUV as something that's traditionally real drive biased and, or has a low speed transfer case or two speed transfer case. If it does not have a two speed transfer case and is not real drive biased, then it's most likely we're going to throw it in the crossover category, even though the manufacturer calls it an SUV or says it's good for off-roading. Despite any of their claims, we're going to kind of keep it in that crossover category because it's not like most SUVs if it doesn't have that two-speed transfer case. So with that as the criteria, the other kind of criteria we had to have, and there's, we're only going to, we're only going to talk about crossovers we've actually driven or reviewed. So we wanted to keep it to a list of vehicles we actually knew, we actually know what we're talking about, and not just speculate. We didn't put a price limit on this. We didn't do any of that. But we did keep in mind vehicles we actually prefer and think about buying. And we do mess with the price and builds and that sort of thing. So Brian and I have done lots of debate over this. We have narrowed this list down to five. He is not with us on this podcast, but should be with us on the next one. We've got a lot of festivities and family events going on. So we decided to just go ahead and go with this one. But he's got plenty of input on these. I'll uh, share those as we get into them. So let's just start with number five. Number five, the fifth best crossover utility vehicle we tested in 2023 is the Honda Pilot Trail Sport. Now, I want to be, uh, I want to clarify some things on these crossovers before we get into them. We had to have tested it. It, but it didn't have to be a 23 model. We didn't feel like we want to exclude a bunch of 24 models because so many 2024 models come out in early 2023. And so, in effect, there are almost 2023 models. We didn't want to exclude them. So, yes, this may have technic- some of these may technically be 2024 models, but we're going to just dive into them and mention the ones we actually like. So, again, back to the Honda Pilot Trail Sport. We're going with the Trail Sport specifically. The whole, all the Honda Pilots are great. We don't have anything against the others, but we're going with the Trail Sport. That's one we actually had. And the reason we like it, kind of the top reasons we picked that, is number one and foremost is the torque vectoring rear diff. I think Honda calls it IVTM. Um, this is an upgraded version they've had over previous versions. And this one's a little stouter, can handle a little more torque and a little more power sent to both rear wheels. And man, it makes a difference. If, look, all these crossovers don't have a two-speed transfer case or a low range, but if they have a torque vectoring rear diff, it's unbelievable how much a difference that makes. That combined with good just off-road programming with the brake vectoring or brake locking works really well here, and it works well here. Um, This is the fourth gen, Honda's called the fourth gen Honda Pilot. It's it is, I'm using air quotes, you can't see me, but air quotes, it's the it's an all new pilot. And there are a lot of things new with it. Uh, one of the other things we still love about this uh, pilot is most manufacturers are going to turbo or forced induction or some sort of thing with that, with the internal combustion engines too, because of emissions, 
so many manufacturers are forced to use forced induction. Um, it helps with emissions, helps burn actually fuel and emissions and that sort of deal. Helps them get their CO2, what they're actually emitting out of the tailpipe down. Well, somehow Honda has figured out how to do it without doing that. And we love that. We still keep and get a naturally aspirated V6. It's still 3.5 liters, but this is an all new V6. This is no, really nothing to do with the old 3.5 naturally aspirated V6s in the old Honda Pilots. Bad news? We do lose VTEC. Um, Honda fanboys are going to be upset about that. But we do get dual overhead cam, and it's a ripper. Um, Honda, I think, claims this is the most powerful naturally aspirated V6 they've put in their vehicles. I um, have to check into that. But it does make 285 horsepower, and that's pretty good, and no slouch, and drives wonderfully. It's paired with a 10-speed automatic, and we had no problems with it. We loved it. Going, Moving on to the interior of this thing, the packaging is just unbelievable honda knows how to do packaging it is unreal now to some of the specific trail sport things you get in the trail sport model you get an extra inch in suspension height they have a tuned suspension for off-road use um, which helps with all the departure and approach angles which uh, and then you also get a they're calling them all terrains brian and i call them mild all terrains it's a falcon wild peak type trail tire Kind of, you're starting to see this trend in a lot of crossovers. They're a little less aggressive all trains, but they're a little more focused for maybe trail driving, fire, you know, fire roads, that sort of thing, forest service roads, um, as long as it doesn't get too challenging. Um, and you know what? They work. It, they do have better grip. You can go watch our video. We did a hill test on this, and it did pretty good. It was pretty admirable. It really did a good job. The tires combined with the torque vectoring rear diff helped a lot. Maybe the second best thing. To, for the trail sport, besides torque vectoring rear diff, though, is Honda gives you real skid plates on this sucker. I mean, they really think you're going to and want you to try to push this thing a little bit and put it over some rocks, put it over some obstacles, and fear not. You're not going to destroy your soccer mom SUV because Honda gives you the protection and actually pretty thick skid plates on the oil pan and transmission and that sort of deal. And it that's very help, helpful. Having recently been on a little overlanding trip with Brian and... Uh, we we the skid plates come in handy i'll just say that would this vehicle have made it on that trip maybe um if you're if you want to know what trip we're talking about there's a jeep gladiator uh, our long-term tester we have a video out on that and you can see some of the obstacles we ran into there i think it would have struggled on one of the bigger obstacles but it would have been fine on everything else this thing is a pretty good package so anyways that's our number five the honda pilot specifically the trail sport trim Let's move on to number four. But before I do that, I need a little cup of coffee. You want to give me a little sip here? Hang on. All right. Sorry about that. Number four, the Subaru Crosstrek. Yes, this was uh, specifically a 2024 model. Again, Subaru is calling it all new, uh, third generation Crosstrek. Uh, the good news is they keep all the proportions the same. It hasn't grown. So many new vehicles grow and they get so big and it's really not fun and makes it harder to drive and kind of ruins the whole experience. But the manufacturers are trying to keep you in those models as your family grows. Well, I like that Subaru hasn't grown this Crosstrek. To me, if you want to move up in a Subaru model and stay in that, and you got a bigger family, get the Outback or get something bigger or, something, or a Forester or something like that and work your way up to the Ascend, I guess. But the Crosstrek, let's go back to that. This is a great small car. There is one bad thing. The one bad thing we're losing in the 2024 model is we do lose the manual. And yes... It's stuck with the CVT. You know Brian and I do not like CVTs. But I'm going to tell you, this CVT is a good CVT. In fact, it's probably the best CVT out there in the marketplace. The particular model we had and we really enjoyed in our time with was not the Wilderness Edition, although they are coming out with the Wilderness Edition. We can't wait to get our hands on that. So, yeah, we're picking this one even without that. It was a limited trim. It had the 2.5 liter uh, Boxer Flat 4 which we like because it gives us 30 more horsepower over the two liter. So that puts you at 182. And I'm just here to tell you, it needs it. Look, a modern car should, in my opinion, should make 200 horsepower. That's kind of where we're at. And this is, gets you closer to that. And I wouldn't be, I'd be okay if I had more. I'm just going to say that. So, but let's get to the things that were really good and really helped us. Number one, again, I already mentioned the, the size of it. They kept it where it should be. Interior wise, it's simple. It's straightforward. It's not too fancy, and 
there's a big difference between premium and quality. That's one of the things we really mentioned, I think, in the review, if you go back and watch our video. It doesn't necessarily feel premium, but it feels quality. It's not the finest choices of material, maybe, but you can just tell they're very durable and they really are going to hold up. It's like a really good, I don't know, backpack you pick from REI or something. That's what this whole car feels like on the inside. The seats are comfortable. The dash, the dash is great. The armrest is good. Everything, nothing feels cheap, but not necessarily premium. It just feels quality, and that was really nice. Um, MVH wise, this is a pretty quiet car. Look, this is one of their more economical choices for Subaru. It's one of the cheapest cars you can get from them. Well, I guess it is the cheapest car you can get from them. It's pretty quiet. The noise, vibration, harsh, harshness is low. What we loved about it going up the hill is X mode. You get, it's kind of funny. We kind of make fun of X modes. Um, but you know what? It really worked. When we were going up our hill, we got it kind of crossed up. We couldn't take it up the main line. And that was some, you know, approach and angle issues and tire choices. Wilderness would probably make it. But we got it crossed up, kind of the hybrid line. And X mode really came into play there. So many vehicles we try to take up our hill that are CVTs. When they start getting pushed and have trouble with traction and slipping, one of two things happens. They can't, the traction control can never figure it out, or the transmission just starts overheating and it basically shuts everything down and says, you can't do this, and says stop. That's not what happened here, and that was really neat. So what happens, is we, as we got it crossed up, it started losing traction. You can see the power being split to the different wheels, the system finding the traction where it needed to go. The CVT never overheated because it's been upgraded and it's robust. And that combined with the symmetrical all-wheel drive, which is way better than what we usually get in little crossovers, because this is kind of this kind of a real drive biased engine, really. It worked well and it got right up and over the, the little obstacle, got to the top of the hill, watch our video to see the details of that. We were quite impressed and quite pleased. So much so, in fact, because of its value and its capability and the standard all-wheel drive. Our mom was in the market this past year for to replace her old Honda Accord. And we had this high on her list, told her to check it out, and she loved it. And I'll get to the details later of what we ended up with, because that leads us right into our next pick. And our next pick is all-new Hyundai Kona. This is maybe Brian and I's most surprising pick for the list, this list, because when we tested the previous version of the Hyundai Kona, I'll just tell you, it's one of the cars we liked the least it was cheap it was noisy it felt like it just didn't even feel like it didn't feel like good quality it's not a vehicle we would recommend really to anyone but then we got this model in and it's got let's just start right off the looks this is probably its best thing it looks very stylish look hyundai nailed it it is not a boring looking car it is really unique it looks like an ev people ask is it an ev all the time and that's what I love. I really hate in this industry how EVs get all the credit for being forward thinking and futuristic looking that and that sort of deal. You can make an ICE motor vehicle look futuristic. Don't be so lazy manufacturers and be forward thinking and progressive and push the envelope. And Hyundai did that here with the Kona. It looks superb and it looks like a new car it looks like there's something different going on with it and there is because you move on to the interior and hyundai didn't sleep on the interior either they continued with that hyundai and kia one of the things we're starting to notice over the last few years a trend that they're doing they're doing the old ford trick and that is the ergonomics are spot on and what we mean by ergonomics on the interior is Everything's just where you think it should be. We Look, we drive a lot of different cars back to back to back to back from all kinds of different manufacturers. And some are, are really quick to pick up. Some are not. Anytime we get in a Hyundai Kia, all the controls and switches and buttons and dials are just kind of right where you think they should be. And what's most impressive with the newer models we keep getting from them is they're not cheap anymore. So... Ergo is great, but if it's really cheap, you kind of don't even want to touch it. This Ergo is good, and it doesn't feel cheap, despite this basically being Hyundai's cheapest car. So back-to-back -back vehicles where the manufacturer sends was one of their cheaper cars, and we love it, and we're impressed with their quality. The quality in this is cool. It starts with the shifter stock. You don't have the old T-handle shifter that Brian hates. You don't have a column shifter. You don't have a button. You have this really weird, like, 
not not a dial, but a stock on the on the steering wheel. Kind of Mercedes like you have a stock, but it's it's easy to use. It's big. It feels quality. It it feels like metal, although it's not metal. And it's just it's intuitive and it's easy to turn. And it what that does is it frees up so much space. One of the things that drives us crazy in newer cars is because every shifter is now electronic and it's not connected to the actual transmission. You can put the shifter wherever you want and free up console space. And Hyundai has done that here. Now, the lower trim models, you don't get that. But I think if you get the mid-level package and up, you get this shifter stock onto the column, which frees up. It's moving on to the center console. All kinds of space. And you can put water bottles and purses or bags or whatever. You get so much room in a vehicle that is really not that big. So they've kind of nailed the whole packaging trick like Honda does. And what this is, and what I like to think of this is as, this is the Alt Crosstrek pick. This is the Alt Subaru pick. If you are if you got some sort of stigma or a hang up with Subaru, it, but you want some of the things that Subaru does, and that is, you know, some of the cladding on the side to protect you from scratches on trails or the all -wheel, or you want all-wheel drive and you want packaging, this has all that. Um, no, it's, maybe it's not the best all-wheel drive that they call theirs H-Track. But our particular model was all-wheel drive, and we took it up the uh, hill, and we got it crossed up, just like the Crosstrek. I will say it didn't do as good as the Crosstrek, but it did almost just as good. And for that, we were quite impressed. Con in conjunction with everything else and its price, this is a home run. So much so, and this is why it's number three on our list, just ahead of the Crosstrek. This is what our mom ended up purchasing. Um, she drove the Crosstrek. She loved it. She, lo she drove the Kona and loved it, but you know what? The styling, the packaging, the price won us over, and this is where she ended up, and she loves it. So we kind of have a long-term tester in the fleet now. We'll let you know how it holds up. She ended up not getting the all-wheel drive version because she has no interest in going on any trails, and look, we completely understand that. And we live in Texas. She doesn't really need it, So, uh, but we'll keep you all posted with that. Stay tuned. We'll, we'll let you all know where we're at. All right, so... Where are we at so far? Number five, the Honda Pilot Trail Sport. Number four, the Subaru Crosstrek. Number three, the Hyundai Kona. Coming in at number two, the Ford Bronco Sport. Maybe a controversial pick here. And yeah, they haven't really, they didn't really do anything in the 23 model. And I haven't, there's rumored changes for the 24 models. They're a little late to that party yet. Looks like we're probably getting some new infotainment. We'll keep you posted there. We've got some uh, connections with Ford these days. But the Ford Bronco Sport, specifically the Badlands Edition. Look, there's some good choices in all the trims, but we like the Badlands because the Badlands Edition gets you, kind of like the Pilot Trail Sport, gets you an active torque vectoring rear diff. That is basically, I'll be honest, ripped out of the Focus RS and gives you the capability to lock the rear diff as close as you can to actually mechanically locking it. And I'll say this, that is a game changer. Just like the Pilot Trail Sport, kind of echo everything we said there. That makes a huge difference. The The model to get is the 2-liter turbo model. That gets you 245 horsepower and 277 pound-feet of torque. This is unbelievable. It's almost as much as some of the bigger boys out there, and we absolutely loved it. The packaging is fun. It is cool. What's really neat is this thing's based on an Escape, which we've tested that as well. The Escape kind of bores us to tears. It's cheap, not fun. Maybe it's more normal-looking. But look, get the Bronco Sport. The Bronco Sport has got really unique packages. It's kind of like the Maverick. Ford really thought through, how is someone going to use this? How is someone going to take this on some trails, maybe do some rooftop tent camping, or how is someone going to take this with their mountain bikes and go on some trails? How is someone going to just drive on some forest roads? They thought this through, and you've got little spots to put all kinds of gear for hiking or camping, it's really a fun little thing. Um, and again, with the power plant that you get, it's fun to drive to. This is really, you're getting an automatic Focus RS with a huge hatch is what you're getting in a weird way. Um, so lots of fun there to be had. Uh, yes, you get a different engine, but drivetrain-wise, you're getting a lot of fun there. The next thing is, is the proportions. This is, they really thought through, I'll say this is Ford's closest thing to like a Trailhawk. Um, their Badlands is like a, a Jeep Trailhawk of something. So, you know, maybe its best comparable model is a Jeep Cherokee Trailhawk. 
We like this way better. But what you get with this is you get great approach angles, great departure angles, great break of angles. You have a short wheelbase here. You don't have lots of large overhangs in the front or the back. And you get, a, they give you a little bit of aggressive altering here. Not real aggressive, but mildly aggressive. And then Ford's also thought it through with all the accessories you can get for this thing, from tents to bike racks to other little goodies you can put in on this thing. It's really neat. It's really fun. This is the closest thing you can get in a crossover to experiencing the Jeep slash full-size Ford Bronco life of real off-roading, real committed off-road use. This comes in the crossover package, which gets you, which means you get good ride and drive on the streets, good fuel, decent fuel economy for what it is, but you can still go on those trails. That trip I was talking about earlier with the pilot trail sport that we took the Jeep Gladiator on, this thing would have made all those obstacles, no doubt. Ron and I talked about it. It would have fit through everything. It has the breakover angles to get over and everything. This and the protection underneath to survive everything. This is a fun little vehicle. We can't wait to get our hands on one again. It's been a while since we've had one, and we're looking forward to Ford letting us borrow one again. So that's our number two pick, the Ford Bronco Sport, specifically the Badlands. All right, so kind of recap, see where we're at before we get to the number one pick. Number five, the Honda Pilot Trail Sport. Number four, the Subaru Crosstrek. Number three, the Hyundai Kona. Number two, the Ford Bronco Sport. And last but not least, maybe the most surprising pick on this list, especially that we agreed to it. And honestly, there wasn't a whole lot of debate here. Number one, the Genesis GV70. Yes, you heard me right. We didn't say the 80. We didn't, we said the GV70. And even crazier than that, the 2.5 turbo version. Yes, we're not suggesting the bigger motor. We're suggesting the base motor, the four cylinder. This thing is a hoot to drive and mainly value, value, value. You can, we would get, if we were buying this for ourselves, just the base model, get the base model. It comes standard with so many options. It's standard with all wheel drive. You get the wonderful 2.5 liter turbo, which rips and is a hoot to drive. You get the smaller wheels, which is what we want, especially if we're going to offer this thing at all. You get all the opulence inside though. You don't get skimped out on anything inside the interior. It's rear-wheel drive biased, and you can tell. And I mentioned previously, all-wheel drive is standard. This thing is just a great value proposition. If you are just got a long road trip on paved roads, it's quiet. It's comfortable. You will not have any driver fatigue. It's got a great sound system. It's got great sight lines. It's, it's just a comfortable spot. And because it's a Hyundai Kia product, even though it's called the Genesis, the Ergo is superb. Everything's where it should be, except because it's a Genesis, everything feels premium and quality. So you're getting both here. You get everything feels good to the touch, from the steering wheel to the shifter knob to the radio dial to the volume switch in the steering wheel. Everything feels premium here and is unbelievably comfortable. Oh, you actually want to take it off-road? This thing will do it. We've taken this thing up a hill. We've taken this thing on some trails. I drive this on the dirt roads to work, and I just hammer it down, and the suspension rides great. The all-wheel drive works wonderful, and because it's real-wheel drive bias, you can have a little fun in the turns. So much so that this is probably, I think, the biggest sleeper overland build vehicle out there. What I mean by that is, if you want to build an overland vehicle that no one else has, and you still want it to be capable and comfortable and reliable, this is it. The good news is Genesis in Europe has partnered with a German off-road company, and they're actually building some overland versions of these, and they look pretty cool. They upgrade the wheels and tires on them. They upgrade the suspension. They give them a little bit of uh, a little more protection underneath, put some roof racks on them. This thing's mightily capable. Uh, it wouldn't take a whole lot of mods. Going back to our previous podcast, you know, maybe a suspension, a wheel and tire package, and some protection, and boom, you're doing some pretty gnarly trails, getting you to some pretty fun spots. All that aside, though, if you don't do anything and you just drive this normal and you're just a commuter, this thing is so comfortable. The radar cruise control works in Hyundai's better than any other product probably out there, and it works great in this. And you're just going to be comfortable, and you're going to get a great value. $44,900 is the base model. You can get Great color choices in the interior and the exterior, and you're just going to love it. 
This is, we pick this list based on what we would recommend people to buy. And when we do that, we don't look, we don't want people to be mad at us. If you go on this list, if you buy anything on this list, there's a lot of good vehicles we left off. I think anything on this list from the Honda Pilot Trail Sport up to this Genesis GV70, man, you're going to be happy. And if you want to take any mildly off-road, you're going to be able to do that as well. Um, so let's sort of recap the list and see where we're at. We had the number five, we had the Honda Pilot Trail Sport with the torque vectoring rear diff. Number four, the Subaru Crosstrek with, with the X mode, which is actually pretty capable. Number three, the Hyundai Kona, the vehicle we actually purchased on this list. Number two, the Ford Bronco Sport. Again, torque vectoring rear diff makes all the difference in the world. You're getting a sleeper Focus RS. Look into it. And last but not least, the vehicle Brian and I would probably spend our hard-earned money on, the Genesis GV70 specifically. The base model can be had for less than $45,000. With that, thanks for listening. Thanks for putting up with just me this time. And you're welcome for not having Brian on here. We'll try to get more of these, more of these out to you. Stay tuned. Soon we'll have the top five SUV list. And again, that one will, all those vehicles will actually have low range transfer case. That's a, that was a pretty debated list. Uh, Brian and I will get into that. Thanks for listening. Stay tuned for more and uh, we'll catch you on the next one.